In the summer of 2007, I went to Afghanistan to see some of the worst fighting our soldiers have faced in over 40 years. We've just been hit. We're in the open. Uh... I travelled to the front line in Helmand province to try to understand what it takes to be a British soldier at war in the 21st century. The RPG guy that just tried to launch one in here, sniper, just next to me, has just killed him. After five weeks of intense fighting, I returned home. Our camera kit needed attention, and we were exhausted. It gave me time to meet the grieving families whose sons had been killed, such as Helen Gray, who lost her son Chris to enemy fire. I would give anything for them to come home. Well, you know they're not. And that's so hard. Two months later, and I'm going back. My trip is especially poignant, as less than a week ago, the regiment suffered its largest loss of life in one day. Welcome back. Three British soldiers have been killed by friendly fire in Afghanistan. The members of the 1st Battalion, the Royal Anglian Regiment, died yesterday after an American F-15 jet dropped a bomb near their patrol. Two others were seriously injured. The fighter planes had been scrambled to support ground troops who'd come under heavy fire from Taliban forces in Helmand province. Tonight, the Ministry of Defence says it's carrying out a thorough investigation. The men were killed when a bomb similar to this one missed its target. Jesus Christ! That was... Every day, fast air is called in to hit enemy positions. Most of the time it goes to plan, but this time something went wrong. I'm returning to see how it's affecting the men and join them as they carry out their most difficult operations to date. I'm in Afghanistan on the final leg of my journey to join the men of One Royal Anglian. I haven't seen the men for two months and I'm looking forward to meeting them again. However, I want to make sure I get their story right and at the moment, I don't know how willing they'll be to talk about what's happened. I'm back in Camp Bastion on my way to join the 1st Battalion of the Royal Anglians. Having met the families of Chris Gray and Aaron Bonner, and the fact that three more Anglians were killed only last week has made myself and the crew only more determined to see the boys out through to the end of their tour. The friendly fire, or blue on blue, killed three men from 7th Platoon who were fighting at Mazdarak. The surviving members of 7th Platoon are now at the forward operating base in Sangin, and that's where I'm headed. Helmand is a war zone. To make sure we're not shot down, we fly low over the desert, skimming along the edge of the green zone. The trees and crops below provide excellent cover for anyone wishing to launch a surface-to-air attack. Thirty minutes later, we arrive. <laughs> no, 
not exactly BA first class, was it? Not bad, though. Seven platoon have been here a week, defending Sangin from attack. It gives them time away from their base at Kajaki to come to terms with their loss. Very humble. It's good to see the men again, but it's obvious to me the lads are shook up, and this is clearly not the time to talk about the bombing. To get a sense of how much they're hurting, I meet up with the regimental sergeant Major Ian Robinson, the most senior soldier in one Royal Anglian. He's responsible for discipline and morale and is well respected by all of the men. What effect has the incident had on 7 Platoon? It was a platoon from, for, uh, sorry, a section from 7 Platoon that, um, that, uh, that received all the casualties. Um, we went up, me and myself and the CO went up to see them the next day, uh, and they were remarkable, to be honest. Um, I was expecting quite a lot of anger. Um, I was expecting a fair amount of shock. Yeah. But um, as I've said previously, the guys have really grown up a lot on the tour, not just as soldiers, but as, as yeah. men as well. They were very, very sad. You know, they were very low. Um, but in the last week or so, they've, they've pulled themselves back up again. You know, and that's really to the credit of, of them as individuals, but also the, the team in Seven Platoon, uh, Platoon Sergeant Sergeant Woodrow and the Platoon Commander, Mr Silkin, um, you know, who were under extreme pressure. You know, themselves as individuals have had to show that leadership um, and bring their guys on, uh, and they've done that. And, you know, the incident and the aftermath of the incident will stay with them and with all of us forever. The deaths of Private Robert Foster... Private Aaron McClure and Private John Thrumble take the total number of Royal Anglians killed in action to nine. Did you have a casualty figure inside your head before you came out here? I did, I did have a figure in my head, really, I think. Uh, I don't know why I, why I did or where I got that figure from particularly, but I, um, I thought around about... 10 was likely to be the amount of uh, guys we'd have killed on the tour. Um, and I suppose secretly I, th I was maybe being pessimistic. Uh, and I thought, and I definitely hoped that it would be a lot less than that. Coming to the end of the tour, do you think the men are more vulnerable now rather than they were at the beginning of the tour? Yeah, we are coming towards the end of the tour, but there's still a sixth of it still to go. So we've got to be very, very careful. Because one thing's for sure, the enemy, you know, to them, each day is the same as the next. Um, and they don't mind whether they kill us on day one of the tour, day 30 of the tour, or the last day of the tour. Tomorrow, 7 Platoon are going back to join the rest of B Company at Kajaki. It's not lost on anybody that this was where the three young men were killed, and returning with them will be difficult. Despite the heat, dust and risk of mortar attack, I've slept well. We join reinforcements on the move up the Sangin Valley to the base at Kajaki. It's a dangerous journey. In 2006, Seven men were killed when the Chinook helicopter was shot out of the sky by the Taliban as it neared the base. Now pilots vary their approach to the landing zone to reduce the chance of being hit by enemy rockets and gunfire.
Kajaki is the most isolated British base in Helmand province. It's located right in the middle of Taliban territory, at the top of the Sangin Valley. British troops are stationed here to defend the hydroelectric dam. Its continued operation is vital to winning the support of the locals here. But it only works at half capacity. When fully operational, it will supply electricity to two million people in southern Afghanistan. Tony Borney has replaced Mick Aston as officer in command of B Company and he explains his reasons for defending the dam. Clearly, producing electricity and increasing, increasing the um, facilities for the people of the whole of southern Afghanistan uh, is going to uh, improve the coalition force standing uh, amongst the locals. It's also about regeneration uh, of the local area. And so it's more than uh, just a, a turbine. Uh, it's about providing the jobs uh, for locals um, to stop them working for the, uh, for the Taliban and help to win the hearts and minds. The Taliban don't want electricity any more than they want British troops in the region and would like to destroy the dam. Consequently, the British are continually engaged by the enemy at the FLET, the forward line of enemy troops, which runs north to south of the base here. Tomorrow I will join B Company on a fighting patrol to the southern flat of the dam. It'll be the first time 7 Platoon have fought the Taliban since the Blue on Blue incident, which killed three of their men nine days ago. But before we deploy, I'll speak to the men about what happened on that tragic day. He was in a, he was in a bad way. Um, body armour blown open, uh, clothing missing, and you could see his ribs. You could see they were all broken uh, by the purple bruising up there. He was in a lot of pain. I'm at the British base at Kajaki, Helmand province. Just over a week ago, three soldiers were killed when an American bomb hit and destroyed a compound that our troops are using as an offensive position. I'm about to find out what happened on that day. The following is actual footage of the battle and the blue on blue bomb strike filmed by the men of One Royal Anglian. We've been given permission to use these images by the families of the dead men and the Royal Anglian Regiment. Late afternoon on the 23rd of August, B Company entered the village of Mazdarak. As they did so, they came under fire from Taliban positions in the neighbouring village of Kavalabad. The only thing that separated them from the enemy was 400 metres of dried up riverbed or wadi. 7 Platoon was led by Lieutenant George Silcoon. He was on the roof of the compound that the bomb hit, just feet away from the three men who were killed. I was, I was on the rooftop, air was on task, uh, and two section were with me. On the roof was Corporal Parker, um, Private Lee, Private Thrumble, uh, and Private McCullough. And uh, we later found out inside the compound was Private Foster, firing out of a, a loophole in the wall. <laughs> Sergeant Woodrow was just behind with the reserve section. They were engaging. I was with the reserve section as a platoon sergeant. Mm. We then got um, air 30 seconds or something similar to that, which means um, an airstrike's going in. Uh, is, he, is he on the... Who 
heard the scream of the jet overhead, and then um, then the bomb drops about 150 metres forward of where I was. Um, I thought the bomb initially landed in the wadi. Get down! Get down! Get down! Get down for any frag! There was a uh, a flash, um, a shock wave, uh, which sort of pressed pressed me into the rooftop and. Uh, Felt, felt and uh, sort of saw the fireball um, come over our heads. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I heard anything. Probably, probably not really. But uh, shortly before the blast, I, I did hunk, I hunkered down and crouched down uh, a little bit uh, into the roof, which is possibly what what sort of uh, what helped me out. Big explosion, um, and I turned around to to the um, commander of uh, three section six platoon, and I said that was fucking close. And um, that's when one of his blokes shouted out, "Your blokes are down there." Three zero. I knew it was close. I didn't think it was as close as uh, I didn't think it hit our compound. I thought perhaps it, it might have landed on the th on the forward edge. Uh, of the wadi, uh, just the edge of town, um, but it, it in fact landed on on the compound. Uh, I, I picked myself up, moved round to the roof, uh, and, and then I saw uh, I saw four casualties on, on, on the rooftop. Um, first casualty I come across was um, Private Thumble. Um, didn't appear to be alive at the time. Um, took his body off the roof. Um, the medic then went to work on him. Next casualty down then was uh, Josh Lee. I got him off the roof, um, eye injury. Um, and obviously, the first thing struck me was they had no helmets. Helmets had been blown off, and most of the clothing had gone from the, from the legs. Um, it was quite strange. Um, could obviously see that he was in a lot of distress. Um, legs were cut. Um, and he was in a lot of pain. So we, I just got him, I said, Lee, just fall on me. So I got him to, sort of took him off the roof, uh, got him down. I think the um, medic by that stage had said th Thumble's T4, which means basically um, you can't help him. I think he was dead. Um, medic then went to work on, on Lee as I started getting um, called Parker off the roof, mm. Stu Parker. Um, he was in a he was in a bad way, um, body armour blown open, uh, clothing missing, and you could see his ribs. You could see they were all broken uh, by the purple bruising up there. He was in a lot of pain. While under heavy fire from the Taliban, the men evacuated the dead and wounded and returned to their base at Kajaki. But something was wrong. I went through the list. I said McClure. Trumbull, um, Lee, and Parker, and then I said, "Where's Foster?" Fozzy was missing. We spoke to the blokes, and uh, found out a, my, my signal had been the last person to see him. Uh, he'd been within the compound and, and firing out of a loophole uh, at the enemy position at, at the time. Um, and we realised he yeah, obviously he was obviously uh, under the rubble. How are you feeling at this point? Um, Felt, I mean, th there were there were feelings of guilt uh, that we'd left Private Foster behind. Um, th there was an urgency to get up there, uh, to get up there and find him. And, and in addition to that, we, we obviously accepted that there was, there was quite a high chance the enemy had reinfiltrated and uh, moved back into the area of Mazdarak. Initially, we were digging with our hands. What time of day was this? This was nightfall, n nightfall before we uh, left Mazdarak. Um, we were then sifting for the rubbish, uh, for the rubble. And we, we, we couldn't actually pinpoint exactly where he'd be, so we, there was two efforts going on, one by the wall uh, where the strike was and one by the doorway. Uh, by this time the moon had gone right down so we didn't have a lot of light to dig by and we found, uh, found part of his rifle and then um, they found, they found Fozzy uh, beneath a, quite, a, quite a layer of rubble. I, I think the, the only consolation, uh, again, I'd have to say I, I'm, I'm positive that he was 
killed outright. He'd have been almost beneath where the, where the bomb in, impacted. So how has that incident affected you personally? Just, just numbness really, yeah. It's just a tragic, tragic waste of life. I know you, Willie, you're like a father to them, aren't you? Yeah, you can't help but get, get um, attached to them. That's the hardest thing. And then to pull the bodies out of the rubble. As a, as a father myself, I couldn't think of anything worse than yeah. having to bury children. It's becoming clear to me that the long-term effects of this war are unmeasurable. But in the short term, seven platoon are five men down, and so B Company have been unable to deploy and keep the Taliban away from the base. Now, 10 days later, reports are coming in that the enemy are getting closer and presenting a danger to the dam. Missions and tasks. To re-establish pressure uh, on the southern flats uh, and to find enemy forces uh, fixed with platoon weapons and mortars uh, and then once fixed uh, strike with uh, uh, javelin and air. Uh, platoons uh, should expect to be extracted 400 metres from the firing points uh, to allow air to engage. Platoons are to, uh, once again, seven platoon lead the attack against the Taliban and once again they will have to call in air support at great risk to themselves. It's lost on no one that it's the same air support that killed three of their own men in a similar operation. It's just gone 2.30 in the morning. We're just about to mount up with the FSG, the fire support group. Um, they're heading south out of Kajaki to the FLET, the forward line of enemy troops. Their mission is to engage the Taliban and to push them further away from Kajaki. Um, intelligence has said that the Taliban have been speaking to each other and have said that because the guys are at the end of their tour and because of the blue and blue incident, that they're not prepared to fight anymore. These guys are going out to prove the Taliban wrong. One hundred men from B Company will push two and a half miles south down the 611 highway, which resembles a farmer's track, to locate and strike Taliban positions. When we pass the last checkpoint, we'll split. I'll be with the fire support group, FSG for short, who will give covering fire. Meanwhile, 6th platoon and 7th platoon will enter the green zone to flush out the Taliban. The 611 is known as one of the most dangerous roads in Afghanistan, as the Taliban regularly plant IEDs, improvised explosive devices. These can easily destroy a vehicle and kill the men within it, so we move slowly. Um, we're in a Wimex with Lammy and Reedy. Um, with the fire support group, Snowy, who runs it, is up in front. Um, there could be IEDs laid out in front of us. Hard enough to see uh, in daylight, pretty near damn impossible to see at night. We've reached the second checkpoint. From now on, we're in enemy territory. Most of the road could be seen from the um, observation posts, but certain parts of it can't be because of the compounds, and they're perfect positions for the Taliban to lay an IED, an improvised explosive device. So once we get to certain points, we have to stop, dismount, and sweep for, for these mines. Six and seven platoons move past us towards the enemy positions. It's now 10 to 5. Um, we've been waiting here for about half an hour. As soon as he gets first light, which will be in another 20 minutes, we'll move further onto the high ground to offer fire support for the troops. 
that have now manoeuvred on into the green zone, off to the compounds which there they believe the Taliban will be lying in wait for them. We leave the road and take up our position on the high ground overlooking the green zone. But we have to stop. Up ahead, they've spotted something suspicious. The guys have just found a pressure pad just up the way there, the way that we would have made our way along the track around the side of the compound. They actually found the picks and shovels that had been used to dig in the pressure plate that if that vehicle in front had gone over, it would have been blown to smithereens with everyone in it. We creep towards the ridge, wary of mines and IEDs. It's here that the FSG will provide cover for six and seven platoons as they lead the attack on the Taliban. Snowy explains how he thinks the battle will unfold. What will happen is uh, seven platoon will go in the green zone. Yep. They'll get uh, engaged, I suspect, around compound 250, which is slightly further right than 252. The uh, dismounted FSG, Scythorn, will be on one of them high features there. And I suspect they'll get engaged from 192 or 200. So they'll, they'll get engaged from one of the compounds? Yeah, down uh, south of this road here. And Cy Thorn is with the sniper team, isn't he? He's with the snipers and the dismounted gun team. He's obviously got javelin with him as well. Right. We've given him a javelin team. And they know exactly where you're going to come to, because that's why they place those IEDs there. Exactly. They know this is the only place for the FSG. There's nowhere else for a mounted FSG. And there. you know that they're going to go back to exactly the same positions as yeah. well? And also status quo there, we'll go at the same positions. They'll go at the same position. So Snowy, basically, it's a bit like I'll meet you at the bike sheds at quarter to four. It's exactly fashion. like that. And then everyone goes back home, and then tomorrow they come back and do exactly the same thing. Working alongside the Afghan National Army, they must keep the Taliban at bay. In 2006, the enemy got so close they could fire down onto the base from the surrounding hills. One hour later, and seven platoon are moving deep into the green zone. As yet, there's been no contact with the enemy, but they don't have to wait long. What was that? That was it. Get that 50 going. Right at the edge of 252. Get up, 50. Yeah. Get up, women, go! Get up, women, go! Snowy brings his Wimex Land Rovers up to the ridge line to support yeah, six and seven platoons. Soldiers fire javelin missiles and their 50 cal machine guns. Almost immediately, we come under fire from another Taliban position. We're now taking coming from just over there. The guys are firing at a compound and they're landing over just over our heads, just over there. Down the hill in the green zone, seven platoon are pinned down just 60 feet from the Taliban position. Six platoon are on a roof 250 meters behind the enemy. They target the rear of the Taliban position to support seven platoon. So far, the battle has lasted an hour, and seven platoon are still pinned down. So Snowy, you're just actually taking out those compounds now. You're just actually aiming at those. Can you? Are you IDing anybody from there? 
We'll suppress them. There's two guys in there. Yeah. Firing at us. What we'll do, we'll suppress them and keep the heads down, basically. Yeah. They're all coming soon. There's three trees there, the big one in the middle. Keep them suppressed, keep them in that position Back until the, the air comes and then kills them. It's the best way. Why don't he go around the other side of the wimmy? Just below us, another fire support group led by Corporal Cy Thorne lays down fire onto the Taliban. Every group is working to keep the enemy pinned down to prevent them escaping the impending airstrike. Yeah, that's runs a strafing run. Um, one thing that's been very noticeable and, and the guys have commented on is how good the US Air Force are in terms of, of dropping bombs on the enemy. Um, and this is in light of the blue and blue incident. And one thing that's very apparent is that they've formed a bond and the boys are hanging around um, to make sure that everybody extracts very, very safely. been fighting the Taliban for three hours. To end the battle, they called in an airstrike. Now, there is silence. The contact appears to be over. The F-16s have left. The soldiers in the battlefield are now leaving under the cover of the fire support group. Uh, these guys will stay here now and cover them until the soldiers are in relative safety. However, they are the last to leave and they generally get shot at as they're departing. Six and seven platoons pull out of the green zone, satisfied that the Taliban are dead or have run away to fight another day. We leave our position to meet up with them. It's good to see Woody George and the men approaching. It's been their first engagement since the Blue on Blue incident, and it's a relief to see them back safe. Back at base, I'm told the operation has been a success. The Taliban radios, usually busy with chatter, have gone silent. It's a good indication that a number of enemy have been killed. 
The next day, I get my first chance to speak to Five Platoon since I was on patrol with them in Nowzad two months ago. We meet in the cool breeze of the mountain peaks, high above the dam. It was from here they provided covering fire on the day of the Blue on Blue. Three guys were killed in the Blue on Blue uh, only a week ago. How's that affected you guys? It was, it was hard for me because my best mate from home, sort of thing, I've known him since before he joined the army, sort of, he was one of the casualties. And uh, that, that was kind of hard for me to get my head around at first. And then when I found out there was, like, obviously T4s and stuff, like, the, the attitude and every, all the, everything around the hill sort of thing, everyone just dropped, especially because of how it happened as well. But I just felt completely helpless. Not that if I could have done anything different if I'd actually been on the ground, but, you know, it's, you know if, you, if you're just standing there and you're just hearing the information come in, you just feel, oh, I did, just feel really helpless. You know, the friends out there who are yeah, just going through this really, up. really sort of traumatic time. You know, you can't sleep, you can't sort of sit down, you're just, you're just there. They, they, these things, I mean, it's a bit of hard love. And the situation, you know, how it happened, it's fucking, it's unfortunate. But it is an accident and, you know, joys of war, these things do and will happen. There's been a lot of press at home saying that the Americans bomb our boys again. Is that how you feel about it? No, no not, not no. so. They would, they would, this is a problem, this is a major misconception that they have. They don't understand, as Mark said, you've got the joys of war and, and things that happen during war. The press misconstrue everything that happens out here. It, that happened, right, it's very unfortunate that that happened and we're very sorry and obviously we think about it and the prayers and stuff go to the families and stuff back home. But it's what happens and the, the press have to find a, sca a, a scapegoat for it. They have to try and find someone to blame it on and stuff like that. They Just sell small papers, don't they? Mm. Yeah, that's all they're interested in doing. It's like, oh, look, this will make, this will make good frontline news. It's not, they don't care about the families, how they feel about it. They don't care about the guys that are involved as well as that. It's just, they see it as saying it sells papers. Things, we've, we've got Dutch and French pilots up overhead as well, and Kajaki, who were dropping bombs. It could have been one of them. But the fact is we've got a lot of Americans and they're dropping a lot of bombs, which is saving us a... You know, a lot of heartache, you know, stop, you know, stopping us getting casualties or, or whatever. So they're doing a very good job out here. And, you know, as I said, it's very unfortunate one job short. But if we didn't have the Americans out here, we wouldn't have the far support that, you know, we've got at the moment. The, out of the amount of bombs that are dropped, you're bound to have some sort of... I, I mean, it might sound harsh to people that are going to be watching this back home. It might sound... But this is how we have to get on with it and how we have to cope with it. And that's how we have to think about it. Hard love and the joys of war may sound flippant, but I can't help thinking how much these young men have experienced already in their very short lives. Preparations have begun for the next patrol, this time to the Northern Flet. The brief respite gives them time to check their weapons, but the relaxed atmosphere belies the importance of the next operation. Second in command, is Captain Dave Robinson. Can you tell me about the operation tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow we're going back into Masterac. Uh, Masterac's where we had uh, the terrible friendly fire incident. Uh, and this is the first time we've gone back in uh, since, since it happened. Uh, so we're expecting uh, a pretty tenacious enemy up there with high morale because they all know about what happened because it was on the international news. Uh, there's a pretty effective sniper up there. Uh, there's some very... Uh, effective uh, heavy machine gun fires off to the north uh, and we're, we'll expect a tough fight tomorrow because we haven't been up there for such a long time we really need to re-establish ourselves in the northern flat to stop them to stop the enemy pushing back down south towards us how difficult is that going to be a for the company and b for seventh platoon in particular i mean it's dreadful to have to do it and go back and have to fight again and no, to be honest, no one on a personal level, there's nothing I'd rather do less. Uh, on a professional level, we've got to get back up there. We've got to reassert our, our authority to set this place up so that when we hand over to 40 Commando, uh, we leave it in the state we found it in. I think a lot of people back home, myself included before I came out here, thought this was some kind of computer-generated war where you got into trouble and you, you pressed a button and then out of the skies bombs were dropped and the problem was solved. The unfortunate reality of it, and I wish it was like that, uh, 
is that infantry soldiers have to clear the ground because there's always going to be people who remain in bunkers, in dug-in positions, that if you want to take ground, they have to be moved out of it. Uh, and there's still very much a job for that uh, in Helmand province. Before the operational briefing, Major Borney updates the men on the inquiry into the Blue on Blue incident. It was a tragic accident, uh, as we all know. Uh, the, the investigation uh, is ongoing. Uh, the SIB are still interviewing uh, everybody who was on the ground, and that will include obviously all of the, the platoons. Uh, that investigation will report on the 23rd of October. Uh, there will also then be a British Board of Inquiry headed up by uh, a British full colonel. There will then be the coroner's inquest. This is not going to go away. It's going to take quite a long time. Uh, and for the, for the key sort of uh, players, uh, there will be a number of interviews and things um, that, that take place really probably over the next year or so. It, it won't help anybody to speculate as to who is to blame. Patrol programme... The uh, objective of the mission is to reclaim or deny any equipment left at the compound since the blue on blue. They want to send a clear message to the enemy that no matter how heavy their loss, it won't stop the Anglians doing their job. To show his support, Major General Sutherell, the colonel of the regiment, has written a letter to the men. I'm so uh, very sorry that you and B Company uh, sustained the loss of uh, Aaron McClure, Robert Foster and John Trumbull in that airstrike last week. Uh, it is a bitter blow losing people on operations, doubly so uh, when there are multiple casualties <clears throat> and especially hard to bear when own troops are involved. Uh, very tough and all concerned. Please remember me to George Seal Coon. Um, the loss must have hit him particularly hard. No reply to this, please. Just keep up the outstanding work which you're doing. There you go, George, you mentioned. Um, but it's a very nice letter and I'd like the boys <coughs> to see that, please. There is no doubt that the operation tomorrow will be emotional for many of the men as they return to the site of the bomb strike. About what the soldiers are doing on the ground. Uh, right, that's all the points that I've got. OK, um, right, thanks very much. <coughs> The time has come. They're about to leave the base and hit the compound at Mazdarak. Under the cover of darkness, we will move out over the Helmand River and two and a half miles north up a dried up riverbed. Seven platoon and the fire support group will move off to the high points to cover the attack. I'll be with the HQ unit and six platoon who will spearhead the assault. Bombs will be dropped on the compound where the men died and the assault will begin on the town of Mazdarak. But as we're about to leave, new orders reach the men. It's 3.30 in the morning. We were supposed to go on an operation to destroy the compound where the three Royal Anglians were killed in the Blue and Blue incident. However, earlier this morning, a British soldier was killed and five more have been injured. Consequently, the MERT, the Medical Emergency Response Team, is not available to us, so the CO has decided to cancel the mission. Tomorrow, however, we will be back in the same place on the same operation. Next time on the final part of my journey, the battle for Mazdarak begins. It will be one of the last times I stand alongside the men of B Company. And it will prove to be one of the most exhausting I've experienced in Afghanistan. No! It's, it's, uh, it's really scary here, to be honest with you. Um, we can't see where we're going because of the smoke. Um, they're clearing out the compounds with grenades. The Taliban are just over there now and they're engaging the roof that we're standing on. It's the most exciting morning I've had in a very fucking long time, I can assure you of that.
And you can read Ross's personal thoughts, the story of an army photographer, and get more information on the series at sky1.co.uk slash Ross Kemp. Catch Ross's final report from the front line next Monday at 9 here on Sky 1. Next tonight, Michael needs all the help he can get in brand new Prison Break. <laughs>